what I think about a lot is what is our what kind of things do we have to do now uh, to set ourselves up so that by 2030, 2040, 2050, the economy is very, very different than what it is today. Aloha, I'm Robert Perkinson, a professor of American Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, we're here today, um, an event sponsored by the Hawaii Book and Music Festival, which is hosting a whole series of events in partnership with UH all this month and even into the spring. Please check their website for a full list of events. Um, today's topic is a serious one, how to recover from the worst economic crisis to strike the islands since the 1930s, and looking to the long term, what sort of public investments, tax strategies, um, and public policy interventions we can make to set the groundwork for a sustainable return to growth and to create a kind of economy more like we want, one that's more just and more resilient and more diversified, if we can, for the future. Um, that's no small task but we have a wealth of expertise here with us today. Um, UH Professor Emeritus and UHERO Fellow Sumner LaCroix, LaCroix, who's on the screen with us right now. And after we speak with him a bit, we will go to the director of the Hawaii Budget and Policy Center, Beth Geisting. Um, then we'll turn to Hawaii State Senator and Executive Director of Partners in Care, Laura Thielen. <coughs> and finally, we'll be speaking with Local Five organizer and longtime Hawaii advocate, Kaika Hussey. So welcome, Sumner. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, we'll start with you. And my question is one that people know um, individually, but how bad the recession is for them. But how bad is it for Hawaii writ large right now by the numbers? Uh, first of all, aloha. And uh, thanks for inviting me. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, uh, we've had a massive decline in output in Hawaii. And that's come both from the Kama'aina economy, the non-tourism economy um, has, has declined uh, by double digits, but the tourism economy, which is 25% of our overall economy, once you take into account all the other jobs that are dependent upon tourism spending, not just the direct and indirect spending, but also uh, people in the tourism industry spending and, and thereby supporting other people in the economy. That's about a quarter of the economy. And for all intents and purposes, that sector is pretty much shuttered. You know, a quarter of the economy is probably running at about 10, 15 percent. Uh, that means we're only getting about uh, two and a half to three percent of output that typically would have been 25 percent of the economy's output. Now, if that really was the case that we, we'd say lost output in the combined economy, we'd lost the tourism economy, and that was reflected in our income, then that would be an absolute disaster for Hawaii. But that hasn't really been the case. The decline in personal income is much, much less, and that's because of the uh, massive federal relief that came this spring and this summer. Uh, the massive federal relief offset a lot, of the lost, um, a lot of the lost income that people had from being laid off uh, from their jobs. Uh, and we also had the Paycheck uh, Protection Program that kept some people on their jobs, even though the, business, the businesses themselves were shuttered. It's useful just to remember that we've lost uh, over 100,000 jobs. Uh, we've, we had about 660,000 jobs in the state. We've lost over 100,000 jobs. There's still, uh, there's still around 100,000 people uh, um, unemployed, if not more. Um, and, and, and so th these are really horrific economic uh, numbers. Uh, the key to reviving the economy in the short term, I'm not talking about the long term, but in the short term is to get the tourism sector reopened. And I've emphasized, um, I've emphasized for the last few months that that's a fragile process. Um, it's, it's fraught with danger. We're at a very risky moment um, in Hawaii right now uh, with tourism reopening on October 15th. Sure. We have to stick with the economic policies just for a moment. And then I think obviously we have to talk about public health and tourism too, because as you and others have pointed out, um, there is no strategy for economic recovery without a strong public health strategy. That's right. Um, but I want to ask a question about macroeconomic policy by governments. Um, you know, since the Great Depression, national governments have and economists have garnered a lot of expertise in managing recessions. We learned a lot globally from 2009. Obviously the federal government, the US government in particular is more well positioned to respond to a recession than a state government. But how do you think we've done so far 
both federally and in the state of Hawaii in managing this colossal and protracted economic shock? Well, at the federal level, in many ways, uh, they started off really well. Uh, mm -hmm. The CARES Act was, was, was what it needed to be. It was bold, large. It provided immediate relief that lasted through much of the summer uh, for people who lost their jobs, for businesses that were in distress, for, for airlines that were having problems. I mean, you can just go on down the list there. It did a very good job. Since then, uh, the federal government's uh, economic response has, has been terrible, mostly because of the failure of Congress to pass a, a second CARES Act. Um, I, I'm still a bit uh, overwhelmed at the idea that Congress might go home this week and not actually pass uh, some type of extension. If it doesn't pass an extension, um, I think that's, that's something which is going to redound here in Hawaii. There's a lot of people who are, uh, who, who are finding that their federal relief has, has run out, that they're down to relatively low unemployment benefits. Um, um, we face some real problems. We face some real problems here in the state if, uh, if the feds don't provide us with relief. From the local level, um, you know, we, we really need to make absolutely sure that we, um, um, that, that, that we are not delaying any further our spending of, of CARES Act funds. There's, there's CARES Act funds given to the city and the state. I think in some ways, uh, to be charitable, both to the mayor and, 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 and the governor, they were waiting to some extent to see if a second act would be passed that would provide additional relief to state and local governments. With the feds not passing that, um, I think now there's a tremendous rush on the part of the state and of the city to try to get the um, to try to get the funds spent. That's good because that that will provide a bit of a stimulus here that we otherwise uh, we otherwise uh, uh, wouldn't have had. Our biggest problem here in the state is that there is no trade-off between economic recovery and um, and and controlling the uh, COVID ep epidemic. The way to get to the economic recovery is to control the COVID epidemic, and we we start off well uh, in in our travel bans. Uh, and we look, everything looks really good come June, where we were down to just one, one, two, three cases a day. Uh, but essentially what happened was we let our guard down. Um, and then what we found was that state government had done a dismal job, too, of trying to prepare for what would happen if there were large outbreaks. Uh, there really was uh, tremendous mismanagement at the Department of Health. Some of that's been, been remedied. I have a little bit more hope for what might happen there. Uh, but not only the mismanagement at the Department of Health, but there's been inconsistent guidelines for reopening and for closing businesses that have left people really frustrated and for using them, for, for using outdoor resources. There's been terrible communication strategies. And what this has led to, just, just very simply, is this has been a drag on the economy. If you look at UHERO's new pulse index, which is uh, an index that's trying to take into account a whole variety of, uh, of, um, of indicators of economic activity, um, we started, a, we started a, a big recovery uh, in the economy in uh, May, and that went on through early July, and then all of a sudden we've been heading back down again. And I attribute this to the fact that we've been unable to control our COVID epidemic. Sumner, we lost your audio there for a moment. Okay, so so I attribute, but I, I attribute this decline in the um, I attribute this decline in the um, in, in you hear us new pulse index to us not being able to control the COVID epidemic. Uh, as case numbers rise, an awful lot of people all of a sudden start restricting their activities. Um, we see yeah. we see fewer people engaging in these activities. That's leading to that's leading to a, a, a further decline in the Hawaii economy, uh, and that that's something that would be disastrous if it continued. I'm, um, you know, quite worried that we still have counts around a hundred a day, and while the positivity rate has declined, it's it's not really where it should be to be pretty safe, which will be below one percent, um, and yet we're opening up again. I worry that we have sacrificed the great advantage we had, which was being an island. But um, do you think with the new effort by the city to hire contact tracers, the new effort by UH to increase testing, new to leadership of the Department of Health that we can still um, get this under control? Or are you worried that we're just gonna keep getting battered about? Well, I think we're at a really perilous moment. I mean, I, I think there's certainly some, uh, some good signs in the new leadership that's around and some of the additional initiatives that have been taken to do contact tracing, um, to isolate people and to do testing. Um, that, that, that's, that's all for the good. But at, a, at around 100 cases a day, if we open up to the tourism, we're still going to find new cases coming in via the tourism sector. And at 100 cases a day, that's an awful lot of cases for us to have and to be reopening tourism. So what that tells us is that it's really up both to Hawaii's citizens to continue being vigilant. You know, if we continue being vigilant and mask, social distance, et cetera, et cetera, all the standard things that we know we should be doing, 
Um, if, if we become more vigilant in doing that, our case numbers will fall. We may find a success for reopening of tourism. If they stay at around 100, it's very worrisome because we, we then may have a rebound of cases, giving the additional influx of cases. Right. That could lead to a further close down. We'd end up in this cycle of closing, reopening, closing, reopening, which is not a virtuous cycle at all. You know, part of this has to do with the behavior of all of us. We've right. all sacrificed a lot, and I think almost everyone has experienced a lot of pandemic fatigue and has let their guard down a bit. Um, but there's an economic component to this as well. You know, in the absence of um, relief packages designed specifically for small businesses, right. um, every small business has very strong incentives to open as completely as they can. Um, I wonder whether the EGA administration has been too cautious here in waiting for a second CARES Act and also not taking full advantage of the Federal Reserve's um, municipal liquidity facility. And I'm wondering your opinion about um, the Federal Reserve money that the state has borrowed or, or could borrow from. Well, we have the ability to borrow um, from the Federal Reserve. They have this um, municipal lending facility that they established way back in April. And that would enable the state to, uh, to borrow large, large that would, that would enable the state government to borrow billions of dollars to offset some of its current uh, uh, budget deficit. Uh, th those are basically just short-term loans. At this point in time, uh, I, I, I'm, I, I'm reasonably confident that, that the governor is going to move to, uh, to, uh, to make those kind of loans. Uh, essentially, if you're going to borrow the money, you're really betting that, that the federal government is going to be providing us with additional assistance this winter. I mean, the loans would be due sometime in the uh, spring, summer. They might be delayed a bit to the fall. But what you're betting on is perhaps a Joe Biden victory and that a Democratic Congress and Joe Biden would deliver more aid to the uh, states. It's, a little, it's, it's always a little perilous because we don't know the election outcome until we know the election outcome. So, right. Um, but but hey, uh, states have to take risks in the decisions that they make also. And I, I, see, I, 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 I would be surprised if we did not move. I, I would be surprised if we did anything but borrow the money at this point. Well, if, if memory serves, the EGA administration has moved to borrow about a billion dollars from the Fed, right. um, but has left something like $2 billion still on the table. Um, an advantage of borrowing from the Fed is that it's somewhat insulated from politics and, yes. um, you know, therefore the Fed could provide its own relaxation of repayment requirements if the whole national economy and state economies were in dire straits. That's what one, one person, I think from Beth's right. um, Geisting's outfit, kind of suggested to me that borrowing from the Fed is a little bit like borrowing money from your mom when you can't make rent. Um, you know, uh, it's worth it for us to, it's worth it for us if we believe that the aid is coming down the road to borrow as, 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 as much as we need. And it's at, it's at relatively preferential interest rates. It's a really good strategy and we ought to be doing it and crossing our fingers and hoping for the best this spring. Even if it doesn't work out, it would still be good, I think, to cover the current, right. the, yeah, current problems. If it doesn't work out, uh, then there's more, there's more hefty decisions to be made during the next legislature. There's also been a lot of conversations in state government about cutting state spending. Um, obviously, there's good reason for that because tax revenue is declining and is going to continue declining. Um, but do you think that's the, a wise approach, the kind of limited cutting that has been forecast for all of the state agencies so far? Or, or well, might there be another way? Well, you know, it, it, I think this is one reason why it's, it's absolutely critical to, for the state to be focusing on getting a successful start to tourism, because that will help bring back many of the tax revenues. We have to remember that tourists pay the general excise tax of 4.5% uh, here in Illinois, 4% 4, 4 on the other islands. Uh, tourists uh, also pay the transient accommodation tax. Okay, so, so, so all this tax revenue, um, is, is, are things that will, that will lessen the state's burden. Um, ultimately, states have to run balanced budgets. And if all of a sudden what we see is a, a, an, an economy that's in decline, uh, those, those budget balancing acts will take place at some point. There is some, um, there is some short term, say one to two years of, uh, of possibilities for say state, for the state to uh, sweep special funds, uh, for the state to make less contributions to uh, public employees' retirement plans or to health plans. Those are certainly possibilities. In the long run, if that's continued in the long run, that can do enormous damage. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it is one of those things that's probably limited to, to a one to two years. Right. Um, one hopes that's the one or two years we need. 
<laughs> yes, we do. We, we certainly hope that. Um, one other kind of big question to pivot the conversation a bit. You know, we will eventually return to economic growth. Um, the tourism sector will rebound to what level we don't know, but it will rebound. And therefore, we can grapple in earnest with the question that we've been kind of half wrestling with for quite some time, which is, you know, how to diversify Hawaii's economy, how to make it more resilient to these sorts of shocks in the future. Um, we have a bit of a checkered past with trying to subsidize specific industries, but I'm wondering from your vantage point, if you might lay out some guidelines that you think state leaders could follow in trying to lay the groundwork for a more diversified economy and resilient economy in the future. First, it's worth noting that we have been diversifying. Um, if we look at the apps, if we look at the size of indirect and direct tourism spending back in 1990, it was about, it, it was about, um, uh, uh, it was about 25%. It's fallen since to 18%. I mean, over the last 30 years, we've, uh, we've lost about, a, I mean, the, the, the tourism sector has shrunk in size by about a quarter uh, compared to where, to where it was before. And that's in terms of the overall state economy, not in terms of number of tourists. So in some sense, we already are diversifying. Uh, the number one thing that we can do to make sure that diversification is successful is to get the basics right. And I've always talked about the basics being that we're able to control traffic so that people can get around the various cities and counties. Uh, it's, import it's important that we have a, a strong public school system, the K through 12 system, and a, a strong university because that has offshoots into the rest of the economy. Um, it's, it's, um, 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 uh, it, 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 it's, um, it's, it's, it's just really important to be getting these, these, um, these um, it's, it's really important to be getting the basics right. Um, if we focus on that, we're gonna find naturally that there is some kind of diversification. There's also a role though, I think for tax credits, um, there's a role for things like a carbon tax. A carbon tax will help us make a transition to a renewable energy economy. Um, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a state report forthcoming later this fall um, on the implications of a carbon tax for Hawaii. And it's the type of thing that even during a period of crisis, the legislature ought to be looking seriously at that. The carbon tax doesn't have to be implemented all at once. It uh, doesn't have to be implemented this year, but it would be great if, uh, if a serious attempt could be made to uh, think about it. Um, when I reviewed tax credits um, for the possibility that we want to be uh, providing tax breaks to, uh, to certain crime industries, you know, we, we've done a little bit of that, not so badly. Uh, the, the, uh, the film, movie, and uh, digital media tax credit I think has, has, been, has been mildly effective um, in generating jobs in that industry. But I would emphasize mildly effective. It does take up a reasonable amount of state revenues, otherwise could go elsewhere. Um, I, I was a bit surprised in my review to find that, that, we, had, that we actually had a, a pretty good research tax credit in, in, in place. Um, we basically subsidized seven to 10% of the expenses of a research oriented firm. Those are incremental. Anyways, it's a complicated tax credit, but that's, that's, that's in conjunction with the 7 to 10% federal credit. That means that a firm that's conducting research activities here gets about a 14 to 20% subsidy on, on, on its activities. Um, that's really good. That's just, this is one of the more generous credits uh, compared to other states. We ought to be doing more to advertise it and to make sure that uh, firms realize it's available. Uh, and maybe to talk to some of those firms in California that are looking to be refugees from Silicon Valley and are realizing from all their Zoom meetings they don't need to be in Silicon Valley. Sure. Actually, being out here in uh, Hawaii might not be so bad. Uh, as UH moves to, uh, to think about improving its, uh, uh, a lot of its programs that offer tech skills, uh, this, might be, this might be the opportunity for us to, um, to attract more high-tech firms to Hawaii. Thanks, Sumner. I have a lot more questions for you, actually. And there's questions for the audience, from the audience that are coming in as well. But um, I want to bring Beth Easting onto the line Thank you, Sumner, again, and Beth, aloha. Good morning, or afternoon, whatever, yeah, afternoon. Yes, just barely afternoon. <laughs> yes. Um, you're an expert among other, in among other fields in health economics and policy, and I wanted to kind of drill in a little bit on the healthcare sector because this pandemic obviously has revealed both kind of structural faults in our infrastructure and has also thrown into stark and unflattering relief the inequalities we have in healthcare. Um, from your vantage point, you know, what has COVID revealed about Hawaii's healthcare system overall that works 
and that needs work. Well, let's start with public health. I think that uh, that we have seen that our public health system was not in very good shape to manage um, and plan around a pandemic. So we found that we didn't have the resources or the uh, skills to do effective outreach. We were not getting testing out where it needed to be. We were not crafting messages that really resonated with the people who needed it most. And that's what public health, or one of the, the roles of public health. And so that was a, a real failure. Um, hopefully being remedied and uh, we'll have a, a better future. Another problem that we had was having effective and timely information so that we could act accordingly. So we didn't know where outbreaks were taking place or uh, amongst whom. Um, and that is getting better. It still has a way to go, but it is, uh, uh, it has improved a lot as people started asking questions and using the information, which is uh, an important way to make sure that the system improves is to test it. Um, I, I would also say that long-term, we need to continue to support and invest in our public health infrastructure. And that's because so much of our health status is related to things that really don't have very much to do with actual health care. Um, so if we had a better public health infrastructure, we would be uh, being more effectively reaching out to people, um, helping them understand how to improve their health, uh, how to get behavioral health services in a timely way, getting immunizations. Um, all of those things are all, all really very important. Um, but Health care, obviously, is also really important during a pandemic. And so one of the questions that has come up is, isn't it about time to have a universal health care system or coverage system um, and one that's divorced from uh, the employer-based system that we currently have? And I would say... Just the... Pro to reiterate, to kind of uh, focus on that, of course, we see the problems with an employer-based healthcare system when so many people are thrown out of work. Yeah, absolutely. And that certainly has come up now. Now, I would say that um, the fact that the United States doesn't have universal coverage is a, a, a real shame, and it is something that we seriously need to revisit. I'm not quite so sure that this is an issue for the state um, or that it's the most timely issue for the state. You know, 40,000 people are estimated to have lost their employer-based coverage because of the pandemic, but we also see that about the same number of people were able to enroll in our Med MedQuest program. So it was kind of a wash. You know, almost 50% of the population now is covered by either Medicaid or Medicare. So even though we have seen that uh, private insurance provided by employers is problematic, it really does need to change because it doesn't make any sense. Um, but we do have a series of other kinds of fallbacks. There's the Affordable Care Act, uh, otherwise known as Ob Obamacare. Uh, I was not able to find any data to show how uh, enrollment has changed there, but I'm assuming that some people went there. For people who have no insurance or don't have recourse to those other things, um, we have a system of community health centers that are established to take care of people who are uninsured. And I do recognize that there are certain populations that go for migrants, some immigrants, some other people who fall through the cracks. But I would say that uh, we should be trying to tailor a healthcare solution to help people who are not able to take care of themselves right now. Well, this um, echoes some of what Sumner was saying, I think, is that, you know, in order to get the economy to recover, in order to, um, in order to set the stage for, a, you know, better public health response, we need federal government intervention on the economic side and 
probably providing universal health coverage, which all other industrialized societies have. But that's not to say that there's not work we can do in Hawaii. So, you know, what specifically do you think would you like to see Hawaii state government do in the next year, say, that could position us better than we are now? And, you know, with the with the observation that Hawaii is does have a better healthcare system and a more equitable one than most other U.S. states. Yeah, well, and there are things that um, are underway uh, across health systems. Maybe they're not getting as much attention right now because of the pandemic, but there are some really important things that we can do and should be doing to improve our healthcare system. Uh, there is an estimate that says that 25% of healthcare spending which is an enormous industry in the United States and about the second or third largest industry in Hawaii, 25% is waste. So there are certainly ways that we could be improving our health care system, uh, including standardizing our systems uh, so that healthcare providers and patients are not uh, having to chase around and do different things for, for different different insurance companies. Um, we need to emphasize primary care and prevention instead of specialty care. Like, you know, we put endless amounts of money into um, when we don't take care, care of people and they get really sick, but instead we should be taking care of them on an early basis. Um, we have a shortage of healthcare providers on neighbor islands particularly, but if we were fully utilizing all of our healthcare workforce, um, letting them practice at the top of their license, that is letting them do everything that they were trained to do, we would be able to provide a lot more and better service, particularly at a primary care level. Um, support alternative access to care like telehealth and using the phone and email, increasing the convenience and care coordination and navigation. I mean, those kinds of systems, unfortunately, are are really hard to to make happen because we are such a capitalist and uh, private sector um, kind of system for our healthcare. But those are the things that could make a big difference. But the other things that really truly would make the most difference is investing more in the things that help people be healthier, like decent housing, like a decent education, like opportunities like reducing the stress of racial prejudice and economic prejudice. Um, okay, well, let's, let's I, I think, let's turn to the larger frame for a moment. Um, with Sumner, we were speaking about the actions we need from the federal government and actions that the state government might take to restore economic growth. Um, but even when growth is restored, we have found and the evidence shows overwhelmingly that over the last two generations, that wealth has not been, and that prosperity has not been shared very well. And our society has become more unequal with more of the benefits of economic growth concentrated at the top. Um, you know, Hawaii's economy was humming along before the pandemic, but still a great number of people at the bottom were just barely getting by. Um, many were working more than one job to get by. Many were going into debt to get by. Um, for almost everyone in Hawaii, it's hard to make rent because the housing is so expensive. Um, to your mind, what are the biggest priorities that we should have as we start emerging from this crisis um, to make sure that we have an economy that is more equitably and democratically distributed so that everyone benefits, not just um, the few? That is the important question. And Sumner had his short list of things that he thought we needed to do. I have mine too. And at the top of my list is housing that people in, who live and work in Hawaii can afford. Um, so we need to, in, you know, I just don't think that we can possibly have a good economy that uh, supports people in the middle, not just the rich, not just the poor, unless we really 
focus on housing. So for me, we need to invest more in housing. Um, and this has to be housing that people at various income levels can afford. We tend to build housing now just for people who are rich, um, but, but we need to have the whole gamut. Um, we need to put those housing developments uh, in multi-income kinds of communities so that we don't just have uh, you know poor people who are penned up in Kalihi or Nanakuli or some other community and we really need to have multi-income neighborhoods um, and we need to keep that housing affordable so we if it is for sale housing for people who are at a redu reduced income level it needs to remain available for people at that same income level it can't be sold at market prices after a few years and then will never be affordable again so those are that that's a big expensive need right. but it's absolutely essential well i, I think it's heartening um, that there are many points of convergence between what you were advocating and Professor LaCroix was speaking about. Um, I thought it was interesting that he noted that the best way to set the stage for economic diversification are kind of basic investments, housing, K-12 education, a healthy university sector, and transportation. Um, sounds like we add to that healthcare and public health and you know, that's not, we're not looking at the need for niche investments, but broad kind of investments to create the sort of society that we want, um, all of which cost money. My last question for you, and then we're going to turn to Senator Healan to kind of talk about what's feasible in the political process is, um, you know, if state government needs to take on more responsibilities and make greater investments to ensure that we can have the kind of economy we want, do we need to look more seriously about the progressivity of the tax code? Yes, I think that we do have some opportunities to try to bring in more revenue and we certainly will need them. Um, and we need to have a lot of different strategies going at the same time. So we saw at the federal level um, how unfair our tax system is when you see that uh, uh, the self-proclaimed self billionaire, President Trump, pays less than somebody making a, a pittance of, um, really. Um, so in 2017, uh, the Trump tax reform uh, gave big tax breaks to rich people, corporations, uh, inheritance tax. Now, Hawaii didn't follow all of those things, but I think that there's room at the top where we could try to recapture some of those uh, gains on a, the federal level and try to bring in uh, some, some more income at the state level. Um, we also know that uh, we have an aging population and we're one of only 10 states that doesn't tax pensions at all. I know this is like the third rail and uh, nobody is going to want to talk about taxing elderly yeah, people. Everybody loved you it. Know, it's my demographic. Was... I'm ready to pay my fair share. Yeah. Uh, and I think that we really do need to think about that. We provide tax exemptions, $100 million worth to people who are 65 and older. We also don't tax pensions. Um, I think we need to give it another look. Um, and then tax credits, as Sumner was talking about, they can do a whole lot of good, but we need to take a look at at them and see which ones are doing a lot of good and which ones aren't. And I would maybe try to ratchet up the ones that help individual low-income families like the earned income tax credit, uh, food and, and um, rent tax credit, things like that. Sure. Yeah, I mean, just adding revenue to the conversation, I think, is helpful. It's disheartening to me that the kind of conservative anti-tax movement has been so successful, even in a supposedly true blue state like Hawaii that um, when faced with this economic crisis, the administration and most of the political establishment has really only been talking about cuts and not talking about revenue enhancements at all. So important. And, and the anti-government, anti-tax movement has been so successful on a national basis. For most of the 20th century, the marginal tax rate, income tax rate, was 70%, as high as 91%. We have definitely gone the wrong yeah. way. And the fact that capital gains tax and are even lower than income taxes. Yes. And that there's no taxes on wealth at all, even though, except for some property taxes, um, 
even though so much wealth has been concentrated in these recent economic booms. Um, okay, this is all an ambitious agenda. Thank you very much, Beth. I wanna bring on Senator Thielen. Um, Senator, at the beginning of the last legislative session, when the first cases of coronavirus were just starting to be reported in a market in China, um, there was a pretty ambitious kind of consensus effort to try to rectify some of these inequalities. Um, take us back to that moment. Um, let us know what you think and let us know what you think might be possible now going forward, now that the economic circumstances have changed so, dramas so dramatically. Um, well, I guess I should begin by saying, you know, I agree with the two previous speakers that in response to um, this huge economic recession that we're facing nationally and locally, um, everything that the economists say, everything we learned in, in 09 and in earlier, um, you know, global and, and local recessions, um, government should not retract. Government needs to keep people afloat, uh, prevent people and businesses from going into bankruptcy, keep businesses alive, and, and then the economy will recover faster and it will recover stronger. So it's a time for us to invest in people and local businesses. Um, yeah, let's let's underscore this for everyone because i think it i agree with you it is of utmost importance because it's counterintuitive all of us under we're used to thinking of governments um, through the metaphor of our own family finances but governments in fact are not akin to families in their economic management they're responsible and have they're responsible for all of us all of us contribute to government and they have governments have a unique set of tools and it's true what you're saying, um, and I think Sumner was making this point as well, that the overwhelming evidence from 1929 forward is that when state and national governments try to make cuts in response to an economic crisis and declining revenue, they make the recession worse. They dig themselves into a deeper hole out of which it's harder to climb. They delay the recovery. And in fact, five years out, they end up with less tax revenue than they would have had if they had continued spending during the direst, the most dire points. Um, well, sadly, that is not though what our leadership is really doing right now. Um, do you think there's any way to change the conversation? I guess, Robert, I, I would want to qualify what you said is that I, it is important for governments to spend during a recession to offset the fact that the general population is tightening their belts, but what government spends money on is um, really important into how fast you're going to recover and sure. how um, resilient you're going to be in the recovery. So if government, um, if the government stops spending at the same time everybody else stops spending, you get into a vicious cycle where the economy continues to spiral down. If government spends only on itself, in other words, we will keep every government worker 100% employed. We will not cut any government spending, but we're not gonna help anybody outside of government. You're still going to have a vicious spiraling down because government is funded from the expenditures from the private sector. So government has to create a balance here in this huge recession where it is um, kind of spreading the pain and spreading the opportunity between you know, the most critical government services that are being provided to people, but also to the general population in the private sector, keep businesses alive. For every business that shuts its door permanently now, you're gonna have a number of people unemployed, number of people losing their health insurance, and they're not gonna get jobs back in that business again, plus you're not gonna have that revenue from that business going. And if you magnify that, you know, hundreds and thousands of times, government revenue is going to drop. And so if, if government thinks, oh, we can protect ourselves, you know, and leave the private sector on its own, we're not going to recover very quickly either. So we really need to invest in um, people. And I think we need to look at who has this recession really hit the most. And even the Wall Street Journal is reporting 
that it's a very unequal recession. It is hitting the uh, median and below median income people much, much, much harder than it's hitting the median and higher than median income people. And we like to point to the wealthy, like it's all Jeff Bezos's fault and Amazon, and if we just taxed him, we'd be fine. But really, you know, we're, we're looking at people that are at the 120, 140, 200% of the median income, are tending to be okay, you know, better off in this recession. Those are jobs that people can do from home, via Zoom, remotely, they have access to a computer, you know, it's the white collar, pink collar. This recession is hitting hard and, and permanently people that are in the 100% and below median income. And we really need to be concentrating on that group. If we were to do, do it in a thoughtful way, we could concurrently make Hawaii more resilient and, and uh, a more diversified economy because we would be investing in, in raising up folks that not only would it help those individual families, but when you're raising the wages of the, of the lower level and you're raising the education level of the lower level, like you know, free community college for people in certificate programs in worker shortage areas, the trades, healthcare, you know, K through 12 and, and pre-K education. It helps their, way, their families, but it also helps the wages for everybody else in our society. So that's what we really need to be investing in. You started with the question of, you know, were, were we on that path before COVID hit? Um, and I would say no. You know, this grand legislative package that supposedly was going to be helping, you know, the workers in Hawaii, when you look at what was being proposed, a couple things were for people that were, you know, below the median income, um, raising the minimum wage and creating an earned income tax credit. Everything else in that package, all six other bills, were huge investments for people well above median income. And it was classified as a worker, you know, helping workers, but it really wasn't helping the group that we that had been hit the hardest by COVID and were struggling paycheck to paycheck prior to COVID. Yeah, and it's tragic that the same people who have been hit hardest economically also are clustered in the demographics that can't work from home and are forced to go out and be exposed to the virus at more dangerous levels. So we've seen both the public health crisis and the economic crisis affect the same groups disproportionately in Hawaii. Well, and for, for the ones that have been able to keep jobs, yes, that's true. But they're also right. the ones that have been hit the most with um, unemployment. And, you know, um, we've seen a lot of um, discussion about unemployment. It's, it's not been handled well, but I do want to point out, you know, we have zero benefits going to the many, many, many people in Hawaii that have been working two jobs and they've lost one. So they're still employed. They're not eligible for state unemployment. They weren't eligible for the pandemic unemployment assistance, but their family revenue was cut dramatically. And so we've got a lot of people that are underemployed and that are hurting very badly, you know, and, and they're not getting assistance um, from the, any of the unemployment. Well, and yeah, those of us who are in jobs that do allow us to work remotely or who have not had any income cuts yet, and, that, and that's a big sector of the economy too, which is good. That means we can pull together that sector to help everyone else. Um, what's your thought of, you know, how possible that is politically? You know, A, to maybe get the cuts in place to workers who are public sector workers that are who are most able to handle it, which is maybe not that many, but B, you know, um, perhaps revenue increases, tax increases for those who do have their jobs to help out everyone else, and these sort of investments that are necessary to cushion the blow for such a large portion of our population. What do you think is, what needs to be done first, and, and what do you think might be possible or what might help us get there? Well, if, it, if I could wave a, a magic wand, um, I think what we need to do is we have to keep uh, people from slipping into poverty um, and we need to keep businesses alive. You know, any business that has to, that goes out of business, I mean, that, 
this is not the time necessarily to focus on the um, creating new business because that takes a long time. A new industry takes a long time. What we want to do is we want to keep as many things going as possible. I think we have to um, get people back into the workforce. We need to keep people in Hawaii because we're projected to have a further decrease in population, um, a net decrease. And so we're going to lose some skilled workers. So I, what I would focus on, you know, people have talked about um, housing. We have the lowest percentage of home ownership in the nation or among the lowest. Um, renters are particularly at risk when the governor's emergency ban on evictions uh, eventually expires. Uh, we're predicting to see a, a large number of evictions. We do have some rent relief going into place now with the CARES relief money, but we should be uh, focusing on getting landlords and tenants into some type of mediated process where there can be a forgiveness, you know, in exchange for some of the rent relief or forgiveness of past rent you know, and, and let people move forward. For the landlords, you know, you can only get, you know, so much when nobody, when somebody doesn't have money. So there's, you know, certain things we need to do there. Um, I think getting people into the workforce, we, we did have a proposal uh, for a minimum wage increase. Um, but I think what this is illustrating is family leave is really critically important. Um, nationally, women have permanently left jobs because people, child care is closed, schools closed. And a lot of the women have ended up staying at home being the primary caregiver. You know, in a pandemic, you don't want people going back to work when they're sick. And we need to get women back in the workforce, even when they're primary caregivers. Um, I like family leave because the cost is fairly States that have done it, they've gone back and economically looked at it, and it has not been a burden on business. And all businesses already tend to be providing family leave because you know you're working side by side with your employee. You know when somebody at home is sick or they're sick, and and they make it work. It's the you know the WalMarts that aren't providing family leave. So you know let let's pass a family leave and let's you know get people back into the workforce where we need them. Um, we could do a minimum wage and defer it as tossed. Uh, we had it proposed to be increasing over a four year period. Maybe we link year one to when the economy is back up to a certain percentage or the unemployment rate is below a certain amount. So we can see that we're on the road to health, but pass something that starts it, that links to that start date and get it up to a, a level that will get people back in. And then let's invest in our people. We got a lot of people that are unemployed or underemployed. Let's give free community college for six months to one year to any type of certificate program. And there are programs you can get a certificate in six months to one year um, in their worker shortage areas. University of Hawaii has already identified those. Again, our trades, our healthcare industry, and our education, pre-K and K through 12. And those um, really good investments to both increase and stabilize our economy you know, and help a, a faster economic recovery. Um, these are all excellent. I, I wish you did have that magic wand. Yeah. Um, but since politics, sadly, is not the, an art of magic, but of political mobilization and force and negotiation, um, two questions, two kind of concluding questions. One, which of these kind of priorities that you are discussing, pre-K education, uh, sick leave, better tuition for university students and so on, which do you think really shows promise and could move like in the next legislative session? And two, what do you need from the public in order to open the political space so that some big ticket items like this really can move? I think um, pre-K has had a fair amount of momentum and there is a lot of popular support for it, so that's possible. I think on the family leave, the minimum wage, um, I'm sad to say that, you know, the Hawaii legislature is not as progressive as it was back in the, you know, 50s and, and 60s. Um, then the legislature, even in the 70s, was willing to pass like the universal prepaid health care, even though businesses were saying, don't do it, you know, or 
or land reform where you know the large estates had to sell the fee land to the residential owners instead of having leasehold you know the legislature passed things that helped the vast majority of uh, lower wage workers in Hawaii and it and they resulted in economic expansion even though the power players were saying don't do it I don't see that same will now. What was being proposed at the beginning of 2020, pre-pandemic, is supposedly groundbreaking and progressive. The minimum wage increase from $10.10 to $13 over a four-year period. I mean, that's pretty, that's nothing. And then family leave was off the table. And this is from a Democratic-controlled legislature. I mean, it was really, really, it was crumbs to people at 100% of the median income and below. And that's half the population, half the population of Hawaii. The legislature was not willing to take on the powers that be to provide some assistance. I, I think it's ridiculous if we wouldn't do a family leave this year. It, it, again, it's a pandemic. What do you not understand about the fact that low wage workers, the ones who don't have family leave, need to stay home when they're sick so that they don't spread disease and destroy the economy. Pass a family leave law. I mean, of all the things that we need to do, we need to do that. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank, you for, your, thank you for your service. And we are um, sad to see you leave the legislature, but keen to see what you'll accomplish outside of it. Thanks. And I actually should uh, make one correction. You introduced me as a state senator and uh, director of Partners in Care. That's my sister-in-law. There are two Laura Thielens. So she's my little brother, and that's Laura Ellis Thielen. I'm, I'm what the family calls birth Laura. They call her the good Laura. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, um, thank you. And best, luck, best of luck to you in your next endeavors. Thank you. Take care. You know, it was interesting that in that final segment with Senator Thielen, she was kind of looking back um, nostalgically to the more activist style of government in the 1950s and the 1960s, mm -hmm. you know, nationally that gave us the Great Society, the War on Poverty, mm -hmm. um, the unions that gave us the middle class, and we have indeed kind of departed right. from those commitments to shared prosperity in the last 40 years or so. Right. Um, so looking toward the future, you know, how might we get back to the past or at least the parts of the past we might want? Well, you know, I think it's important to, um, to put that question into uh, sort of a timeline, right? What happened between, you know, the, what, what we saw in terms of really progressive Hawaii legislature and progressive U.S. politics in general was a time of, of economic growth. It was the post-World War II era, right? And that goes up until 1973 or so, and then we start to see um, a, a, a sort of the, the rise of the neoliberal ideology. Um, it's sort of personified in guys like Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, and that carries us all the way to the point now where, as the previous speakers have all said, it's more apt, it, it makes more sense politically for folks to talk about cutting government, even in the midst of this major recession and depression, in uh, rather than serious conversations about how to raise new money to pay for the things that we all need, family leave act, uh, family leave, that kind of thing, uh, universal health care, the basics that Sumner was talking about. Um, and I mean, I, I have a pretty dark view actually of the next 10, 20 years in terms of US politics. Um, I don't think that Trump is really an aberration. I see him as sort of a, um, a result of, of, the, of the really problematic U.S. politics of the last several decades. And even under a Biden administration, I don't see the situation um, improving dramatically at the fundamentals of the U.S. economy. We're still going to see a situation where, you know, um, what Thomas Piketty calls uh, R greater than G, where the returns on capital are greater than the returns on labor, and where the, the benefits of the, grass, of, of the gross economy accrue to the very wealthy instead of to the working class. So these are sort of secular trends, which we need to be really cognizant of. Uh, what I think about a lot is what is our, what kind of things do we have to do now uh, to set ourselves up so that by 2030, 2040, 2050, the economy is very, very different than what it is today.
I'm a, I'm a little more optimistic than you are, I think, about the, uh, the future in that I think, I hope, that the political culture of the U.S. might be fundamentally shifting. Um, yeah, but it's going to take, it's going to take um, the, the folks that are like the, the Sunrise Movement kids, right? It's going to take them getting into power, which is going to take, right. I don't know, 10 years, 15, right. 20 it can years. Take some, it can take some time. And it took right. conservatives some time to enact right. the more ambitious elements of their right. agenda. That didn't come with Nixon. Even with Reagan, it took longer. I mean, frankly, the conservative powers in the United States are really good at playing long game politics, right? You see them playing um, uh, over decades uh, of politics where they insert, you know, idealistic folks in their, on their uh, side of the ideological spectrum into city council races, into boards of education across the United States. They put them into low um, federal judgeships. And so over time, you get to this point where now um, the, the death of, of one Supreme, Ju Supreme Court justice has thrown the, um, the entire court into disarray. And it's really, they've, they've done an incredible job. And I, I sort of wish that the liberal and progressive um, side of the spectrum would play the same sort of long game, very almost kind of ruthless politics. Sure, we see that in the, around the judiciary nationally, especially. Absolutely. Um, coming back to Hawaii, and we're, we're, we don't have too much time. So I wanna talk a little, one last question on the economy, but then, you know, because we're talking about the future, I also want to make sure we address the climate crisis because that's a even bigger crisis right underneath the right. the pandemic. Um, right, it's the current and next crisis. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. but you know, in terms of Hawaii politics and mm -hmm. you know the possibility of moving Hawaii state government to take at long last some more concerted aggressive action on you know sharing prosperity uh, investing yeah. more fully in education and housing and public health what do you think needs to happen for the political reality to shift is it in the union movement is it in the hawaiian movement is it coalitions among the poor um what do you think all of the above will unlock all, of, all of the above all those are great um and I, I would say I would I would say everything that that the previous speakers have said, adopt those remarks as my own, with a few quibbles. Um, I, I think that the reopening question in terms of the tourism economy, it needs to have workers at the very center, at the core of the discussion, which frankly is not the case right now. You know, we saw um, all the conversations happening at the the state house uh, with the, the special committee on COVID response. Uh, local five workers, tourism workers were not there at all. Service, service workers were not there. Um, and those workers are really at the front lines of this question, right? And we've seen, you know, for instance, we've seen that, um, we've seen a little bit of improvements in terms of the safety on the, on, at, at the hotels themselves, but it's only because we've been doing our own worker-led inspections of, of whether or not, you know, there's adequate plexiglass and hand sanitizer and social, social distancing signs. That's all been pushes by the workers to, um, against the, the ownership and the management structure saying that we need to be safe at these jobs. And I think if we were to you know, project forward 10, 20 years, what I really wanna see is us taking the ideas which have made Hawaii successful for the last you know, thousand years and really strategically import them into our current context, into our current crisis. We need jobs to be created. We also need food to be grown. We need to create our own energy, our own fuels, you know, our own, um, I mean, it, it, forgive me for being crass, but we need our own toilet paper to be created here in Hawaii, right? These are all jobs, frankly, and industries that we should be building. It may not be the job of the legislature, as Senator Thielen was saying, to, to do that now, but there's private investors, there's um, philanthropy money out there that I think is very interested in thinking long-term about what Hawaii can become. And so what, I, what I'd like to see is frankly, more island-centered thinking in terms of how do we feed ourselves? How do we take care of our own needs? And then using that to demonstrate to, um, you know, to provide some Hawaii's uh, very humble leadership to, uh, to the United States, to the rest of, of the world about what, what really works. We know that regenerative agriculture carbon capture, these are the kinds of things which are really the economies of the future. And I think if we can incubate some of these ideas here, it could be instructive for what we all need to do in terms of the global transition. 
what do you hope, um, you know, we've been talking about how to restore economic prosperity in Hawaii and how, try, how to try to build public investments to make a fairer, stronger, more resilient, just shared economy. Um, yes. But, you know, we've, if we're looking 10, even right now, but when we're looking 10, 20, 50 years out, we have to do all of that in the context of the most intensive environmental crisis any of us have ever faced. Um, you know, are, there, are, are you optimistic in the very few moments we have left before we close that there are ways we can take advantage of that, of those perils to create opportunities for Hawaii? I think we need to, uh, I mean, it, it, it keeps me up at night. It keeps me up every night thinking about what we're going to do. The, the one thing that gives me hope, though, is, is that um, huge crises like this are opportunities for us to sort of reinvent ourselves. Um, the other thing that gives me hope is knowing that we actually have some experience, you know, with dealing with, with crises of, of health, uh, of um, economy. I mean, in our own lifetimes, uh, I'm sorry, not in our own lifetimes, but in like the, in the memories of people living today, um, there have been, you know, we have stories. We have stories in, in our Hawaiian families about people uh, knowing, you know, 90% of, of, of families dying because of disease. Um, these are stories that have been passed on through our families. Uh, so we have some, we have some, um, some, some, some fortitude that we can draw from. Um, and, and, and it's both applicable for thinking about how do we deal with COVID, but also how do we think, you know, how do we think about the overall transition that we need to make for, for the economy as a whole? You know, we've dealt with crisis um, and we can be resilient today. Thank you, Kaika. Um, these, are, these are tough times for everyone and you know, especially for the hardest hit families in Hawaii who've lost income, um, lost single jobs or all their jobs, or who've been struck by the virus. Um, our hope, I think, is that we might look, look at the best practices and the evidence to implement short-term remedies to get us through the crisis and begin making some of those political changes and investments that we need to be on sure footing um, going forward. Yeah. I hope we can get there. I think um, we can. Thank you very much for I hope thank you very much for joining us today and for all of your work and so many different causes. Um, and we're going to close. Um, thank you to the Hawaii Book and Music Festival for organizing this event, and its partner, the University of Hawaii, and all the other sponsors that are have made this possible. Um, please visit the Hawaii Book and Music Festival website to see a listing of upcoming events. And we need to have a lot of conversations about the economy. This will just be one of them. Um, but thank you for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. And let's carry the conversation forward and into action. <laughs>